Welcome to episode two of Reconstruct. We're glad to have you back with us. Now, we have three basic episode styles for this show that we've been working on. The first one is we have a guest on who is an expert at something, and we explore a particular theological issue or topic or question. The second is we have a guest on to tell their own story of deconstruction and reconstruction. And the third is just John and I each answering one question from a listener or friends of ours that gets at some difficult topic. For instance, next week, John and I will each answer the question, what must one believe to be saved? But today's episode is the first kind. We are talking with Peter Enns about what the Bible is. We know what it's not, according to him and many others. It's not inerrant. It's not a divine rule book sort of spoken into the ears of biblical writers. It's messier and more human. Okay, what is it and what do we do with it? Now, our goal with these theological explorations is to help us all start reconstructing our faith. And we think we need this because all too often, Christians either complain about what they don't believe in or else they critique what they don't believe in. And of course, Dan and I are occasionally guilty of this, but we want to move away from this tendency. So, in each of these episodes, we want to bring on a brilliant guest, like Dr. Peter Enns, who's an expert in their field and from whose wisdom we all can benefit. Okay, so let's start off. Uh... I don't want, I can't call you Pete, dude. I got to call you. I'm telling you, the only, the only people, the only people have to call me professor are my wife and kids. Everybody else can just. <laughs> All right. right. Okay, Pete. So I'm, I'm hanging up if you say professor ends again. All right. All right, Pete. So <laughs> you've been teaching and writing about the Bible and theology for decades. Why do you even find the Bible interesting in the first place? Yeah. Thanks for making me feel old, by the way. <laughs> Uh, decades, that means two, right? <laughs> okay. um, the, you know, the Bible is woven into my own spiritual narrative, you know, and, and it's it's never really a thought to me to say, do I remove it or not? The question is more, what do I do with it? And how do I handle this well? So I think it's interesting, at least for that reason, um, that it's it's been a part of my life and you know, informing you know, what do I say, you know, how I think and what I think about. And, you know, so I, I, it's it's just a part of me. And I don't take that lightly. I think that's, that's a, you know, a happy accident, let's say, of my birth and of where I was raised and, you know, in the West and not someplace else. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful for that. I think also why the Bible, I guess what makes it interesting to me is that how I find it to be continually counterintuitive to me. Hmm. Um I I keep looking at it and saying what the heck's going on and and I sort of that to me that's sort of a strange affirmation of its of its otherness mm. uh, while it's also deeply embedded in in the human drama right at the same time so what I also find interesting is how willing the, the biblical writers are to be self critical. That to me, that's very interesting. You know, the prophetic voice in the Old Testament, for example, going after kings. Yeah. That's not unheard of in the ancient world, but it's to me, it's like, okay, this is like, this is interesting. And I think probably, you know, ultimately, it's it's the Christian story that's told and, and all its diversity and complexities. But we have here at the end of the day, a God who participates in suffering. And when we suffer we are connected to God in different ways than we would have been had we not suffered. And that to me really, is, it's exciting. It's not just interesting. It's, it's like, it makes me want to do this. What I wonder is, and what, where John and I would disagree, is John has a more robust theology of revelation than I have. We've, we've come to realize. Uh-huh. I'm more skeptical of what I can know from the text. Right. And John's more confident about that. So, can you yeah, yeah. could you give us your theology of revelation? Like, what is the Bible capable of telling us? And what is the Bible with regard to revelation? Is it a form yeah, of revelation? Yeah. Is it a medium of revelation? Is it a witness to revelation? How does God reveal himself through it? Yeah, I think as, I mean, those are all crucial questions. I, I think 
for me, the notion, for example, that the Bible records what God reveals to people from beginning to end, that doesn't hold a lot of appeal to me because of how I'm watching the Bible behave. And there's an inherent tension between that, let's say, model of revelation of the fact that there are contradictory portions of the Bible, that there is development and change of opinion in the Bible. Hmm. So, you know, those kinds of things make me sort of want to say, well, how do I articulate this differently? And, you know, I, I think, frankly, that's a difficult question. I'm probably a little bit more anthropological in how I understand the nature of the Bible, and not so much the Bible is itself revelation, but the Bible is a, let, what you said before, John, I guess, a medium of revelation. It's a means of grace. I like to call it that. Mm. You know, it's a way of accessing this communion with God that's different from, let's say, staring at a coffee cup, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's qualitatively yeah. different, but, you know, putting my finger on what makes it qualitatively different, I'd say basically it's a story that's being told there. It's not the normal things people have pointed to. Here's here's how we know this is revelation. It's God speaking. Well, you know, here here's an interesting thought. Not to go off on a tangent, but this is something I've really been thinking about lately because I've been reading this book um, by Ben Summer, and I've had a chance to speak with him. He has a he's he's a Jewish scholar, fairly conservative Jewish scholar, but he has a book on revelation and authority. Part of what he does in his book, and this is a very intriguing idea, and I want to run with this for a while in my life and see how it works out, but that on he talks about Torah, and the revelation on Mount Sinai was from God, but it was nonverbal. And what you have in the mm-hmm. Bible is human interpretations of the divine voice. And both are necessary. And and Summer, Ben Summer, S O M M E R, he he calls this a participatory theology and a participatory understanding of the nature of Scripture. God is doing something, but the product of it, this is human interpretation as they are trying to follow faithfully who God is, which is why you've got Torah, which doesn't agree with itself. You've got different legal traditions in Deuteronomy versus the priestly writer in Leviticus. <clears throat> Even within Leviticus, you have tensions and contradictions between the Holiness Code and P, and all sorts of things. So I, I looked at that and I said, my goodness, what a... <laughs> I hope Ben forgives me for saying this, but what a wonderful Christian way of looking at the Bible <laughs> when we're talking about an incarnational God, right? That is, th- yeah. th- there's a partnership aspect here that I, I can't articulate, I can't even defend it, other than it's the data of Scripture that drive me towards something like that. So then what you're saying is it is human beings using language, which is inherently limited, to talk about a real interaction they've had with a real God. Is that, am I getting that right? right. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, human language is obviously inherently limited, and we do the best that we can. That doesn't mean, you know, you can't say something (laughs) of God, but we're coming back again and again and again in the Christian faith to the mystery of incarnation and the the mystery of God's connection with with God's creation. And I, I find that to be both a comforting and relaxing thing to keep coming back to, and also sometimes a little bit frustrating, because I say, okay, listen, can we get off this circle? Can we get off this hermeneutical merry-go-round? And the thing is, I don't think we can. You know, the nature of Scripture and how to interpret it, and what is it, and how does Revelation connect, those are things that are very much worked through in process in more of a spiral fashion, I guess. Yeah, and it's great that we're talking about incarnation as a model through which to understand the Bible and God's revelation, because one of my favorite books of yours is Inspiration and Incarnation. And there you Mm -hmm. lay out an incarnational paradigm that we see in Christ for divine and human nature being a controlling metaphor for the way we understand the Bible's divine and human origins. Can you explain that concept in greater detail for us and maybe explain how the Bible's incarnational aspect is similar and dissimilar to Christ's incarnation? Sure, yeah. Um, You know, basically, the idea is basically this, okay? The Bible has sort of divine and human components, Mm -hmm. which is a horrible way of putting it, in the same way that Jesus has divine human components. And, you know, I'm going to get mail about how I don't understand theology by putting it that way, but let's just use language, okay? I'm trying trying my best here. You know, the thing is that I call it an incarnational analogy, and I also call it an incarnational model of Scripture. In other words... 
I'm not trying to say this is the only way to understand the Bible, or this is even the best way, but it's a way of understanding the Bible to explain why it looks the way that it does. So in the same way that Jesus is divine, and that has to be unpacked, right? In the same way the Church confesses that, we also confess that Jesus is fully human, right? So we might say, you know, well, Jesus is more than human, yeah, that's fine, but he's no less than human either. He's completely and utterly human, and all the things that go along with that, let's call it limitation, that emptying that we read about in Philippians, right? That's very, very real, and that's why, you know, Jesus, you know, you see him walking down the street, you're not going to say to yourself, there's God walking among us. You're going to say there's a Jew, and he looks like one, he talks like one, he acts like one, he thinks like one. Yeah. He has a tradition like Jews do. I mean, that, that's part of the offense of the gospel and the offense of the incarnation, that it's not that God became man, but the particularity of it all, that God became a first century Palestinian Jew. That's, mm-hmm. that's what's difficult, and there's stuff that goes along with that. So I, I look at Jesus that way, and, and you look back at the Bible, and you say, okay, listen, We can confess by faith that the Bible is, to use the word, revelatory or inspired or whatever, but I I want to take very seriously the particularity of the Bible. So looking at things like Genesis chapter 1 and ancient Mesopotamian or Egyptian or Canaanite myth and how those things look a lot alike. So I'm not going to say, well, the Bible is inspired, it would never do that. Right? That's like saying, well, Jesus is the Son of God, he would never stub his toe or make a mistake doing a math equation. Yeah. Right? It's just, it's humanity. It's not, it, it, that doesn't make Genesis 1 an error, it makes it human, it makes it contextual, and that's just the way it is if you've got this religious system that has at the core heart of it some notion of incarnation. Right, so it takes the pressure off. This is why you know I, I see contradictions in the Bible, and I say, "Oh my goodness gracious, God would never do that." Huh. Well, if if God is sort of participating with humanity, who are reflecting on the nature of God at different times in different places for different reasons under different circumstances by different personalities, tell me you're not going to get diversity there, and you do, and it's beautiful. So th- right. that's why sort of looking at those two things together helps me process theologically and communicate to people theologically why the Bible looks the way that it does and why we don't have to be sort of surprised by it. So on your view, and this might be taking the analogy too far, but in Christ's case, we see his taking on humanity, not as being a limitation or constraint to revelation, but actually it seems maybe a condition for his most clear revelation. Do you, yes, yeah. Would you then yeah. say when you go to the biblical text, it's diversified and it's it's messy, it's human, but that might not be a constraint to revelation. It might even be a condition for revelation? Yeah, I mean, I'm very comfortable putting it that way. I'd want to think more about what possible implications are, but, you know, if, yeah. if, a, if a God is going to reveal God's self, then you invariably have, I think, condescension messiness, and, well, particularity and contextuality, right? You, you can't get away from this. So there's, it's, it's an inevitability of revelation that it's not going to be kept at a distance. I think the problem that I have with, you know, some of my evangelical or fundamentalist friends when they talk about revelation, it's almost platonic. Yeah. Like God is up there someplace far away, and you know, sort of dropping down, and, and we sort of can, you know, we have to, we have to get past the clutter of these human contextual cultural things so we can get to the real message behind it. And I think that's very different than what I heard you saying, John, about how, you know, this is the medium of revelation, right? This, this is where it is. And you can't, you can't avoid that. You know, there's a quote, which I don't remember completely, by Herman Bovink. Oh, yeah. Early 20th century Dutch, Dutch theologian, which I love because he talks about how the Bible is ignoble. Mm-hmm. And how scripture is is so plain and so contextual and just not much to look at if you think about it. But he says, for that reason, it's the vehicle to reveal the glory of God. Not despite the humility, but because of it, right? See, that's yeah. the paradox of the Christian faith. It's suffering and, and exaltation. It's death and resurrection. That's the pattern. And in the Bible, somehow, we by exploring its particularity and its messiness and its offensiveness, not to try to smooth it out, 
but to let it be what it is, that's going to, that's, that's the, that's the step of faith that biblical readers take to say, in this stuff that I'm reading that I don't even like very much, something is going to happen that I can't script. Hmm. Right. And, and, and that's a good thing. Well, that's basically like, uh, a curriculum that you're outlining, right? I mean, we want to kind of give people permission to see an uncertain spiral type journey with God as maybe the best possible scenario. So does the Bible give us examples of those kinds of spiral like uncertain journeys of faith? Yeah, I mean, I think quite often, actually, uh, and, but particularly in the Old Testament, which is, you know, my commercial for the Old Testament is that, you know, we, we we today have more in common in many respects with Old Testament than we do with New Testament, because the Old Testament is 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 engaging a very long period of time, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, a thousand years or more, and a lot of time for things to go wrong, a lot of times for that sort of spiraling to happen. In the New Testament, the the vibe is different. It's more triumphal that Jesus is raised. And oh, by the way, I mean, you know, read read your Paul and read Revelation, other places, very soon all this is going to come to an end. Yeah. So hang on, right? It's a, it's a different vibe, a different mentality. And we've been the church now for 2,000 years, and there's no sign of Jesus coming back, you know, if, if that's how you understand the second coming. But, you know, we're in it for the long haul. And, and so we connect with some of these places in the Old Testament, like the book of Ecclesiastes or Job or Lament Psalms, that really, really openly question God's justice, God's righteousness. Why is this happening? It makes no sense. In fact, this is against what I read elsewhere in the Bible, right? And and, and you you have that modeled for us in Scripture, which again is is you know part of what gets me excited about the Bible. We're seeing modeled before us the very same kind of spiritual journeys that all of us take, which is sort of a back and forth. It's not just smooth. You know, the the world is not the Book of Deuteronomy where. Okay, here are the rules, here's what you do. If you do it, you're blessed. If you don't do it, you're cursed. Got it? Good, let's move on. You know, Ecclesiastes, Job, and Lament Psalms question that kind of what they call retributional theology. Yeah. You know, Job, I haven't done anything to deserve this. His friends say, yes, you have. They're Deuteronomic theologians, right? Yes, you have. And Job says, yeah, I haven't. Yes, you have. You must have done something to deserve it. And Job was again like, well, maybe, I was like, no, wait a minute, I didn't do anything. This is totally unjust. Why is this happening to me? Right, that's part of the experience of the people of, let's say, the Abrahamic faith. This is, this is what you expect. And, you know, when I think of those who compiled the Bible that we more or less have today in, in the, you know, the post-exilic period, you know, retaining these traditions as part of what would become their authoritative text. That's very revealing to me, that this is a part of the experience that they value, that they say this has to be there. Yeah. What Walter Brueggemann calls the counter-testimony, not the main testimony. Hmm. Here's, here's, the, here's the plan, here's the brochure version, here's how it all works out. But the counter-testimony that says it's not working out. So how far can we can we say... God, I live in 2017, and it's clear to me that if I was born in Iran, I would probably be a Muslim. Why, God? Like, why that? Like, can can it go further to questions that are not addressed in the Bible to sort of well, like, yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? Yes, absolutely, because that's, that's the task of theology, because most of what we do isn't connected to what the Bible quote says. Hmm. And, you know, the, the way you ask the question, Dan, I mean, I, I totally get it, but I bristle when people say, well, how far can you take it? As if this is sort of like a game, as if I can push this. Yeah. It's not how far can you take it, it's when those experiences happen to you how will you respond, hmm. right? It's not like, how far can I take it to this thing that I'm living in? No, it's just, this is, life just happens. And I have to think, I'm forced into a position. It's not something I choose to do. Can I take it this far? Or can I take it that far? It's like, I can't help the thought that's in my head right now. And I will work through it. I will think about it. I will pray about it. I will talk to other people about it. Not, is it okay I mean, what's the alternative? To make believe <laughs> you're not thinking these things yeah. and to just go on with your little life and to play church? I mean, if, if, if all this stuff is real, that can't be true. 
that that's is, my opinion. that is literally the other option in my mind is like to force myself or pray it out of myself or something like that but I, these are the really the things i worry about when i'm honest with myself it's this fear of being wrong fear of having missed the boat like not gotten on the ark in time you know well the thing is you know when you say fear fear of being wrong that already presumes that being Christian is fundamentally about, forgive me, intellectual content on some level. I'm not, I mean, if, you know, in, in the sin of certainty, I talk all about the importance of intellectual content. I'm not dismissing it. But when that is central and being sure about being right is what is driving us, we're very, you know, like, I forget which brain it is, left or right brain, though, with the intellectual side, the right brain, right, the right side, isn't that right? Um, or is it left brain? Do you guys know? I, I think know. it's left. Yeah, Google it. Anyway, that side of the brain that, that covers our analytical portions, you know, that is very dominant in the life of Western Christendom. You know, it's an, it's analytical, it's reasonable, it's and it's all that. And I, I think the life of faith has never been that way, and I think we've actually morphed it into something it's not supposed to be. That doesn't mean intellect is unimportant. It's very important. I use it all the time. I argue. I write. I speak. But when, you know, my my... my my self-understanding as a follower of Jesus does not rise or fall on the basis of how well these arguments hold together. Because intelligent people are always going to have counter-arguments. Right. And I don't think that's new. I think that's very, very old. So if intellectual content isn't the central aspect, uh, what category is between you as a believer and the God with whom you have this dialogical spiraling relationship, would you locate the central category in like a covenantal relationship besides just mere intellectual content? What, what would it be? Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm, I'm comfortable putting it that way. It's, it's a relationship, although that's also very metaphorical. It's, it's, it's the sense of God's presence. The, the, the reality, I say, you know, again, words like this just, you know, I'm very dissatisfied, but the, quote, reality of God in my life, right? Mm. And how I'm always in dialogue, inner, inner dialogue with content. Right? Again, I don't escape that. I don't try to. How do I know this? How do I know that? You know, and, and all those things are very, very important, but they're not the basis and foundation of faith. Faith is not rooted in our confidence that X, Y, and Z are objectively true. It's not rooted in that. It has to be rooted. I, I hope it's rooted in the mercy of God. And I hope those things can come along and we, and we learn to think about the nature of reality as a result of that relationship. So I'm just finished listening to another Karen Armstrong book, The Case for God. So her view is that all scriptures were initially written and are intended to be joined by liturgical practice and an ethical obligation. And I'm just like... That makes so much sense to me. But my question for you yeah. is, is that enough? Or am I looking for something that makes that resonates with me? Might it resonate with me wrongly? John, being of the reform school, might be a little more worried about resonation. Is it resonating mm -hmm. with a with a fallen reason and a fallen mm -hmm. will and a fallen moral intuition? Well, we all have a fallen intuition. We all have a fallen morality. That doesn't... You know, I think John would agree that Calvinists are, don't escape that, even though some that Correct. I know think they have. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, but that's 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 an aberration. That's not you know that's not normal. But um, when the book becomes sort of that epistemological foundation for everything we know and say, read individually, <laughs> you know, in the morning, what God is saying to me here through this book, God speaks through worship through, you know, liturgy, so creating sacred space and sacred time, through the community, through our actions and activities, right, which are supposed to be ethical, and that doesn't mean, you know, don't drink too much beer, but it means how you treat other people, yeah. especially those closest to you. And I think that that's a very full-orbed understanding of the nature of the life of a Christian. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is very much a part of liturgical expressions of the Christian faith, not as much of biblicistic expressions of the faith. What do you mean by biblicism? I, I know, 
just for the well, listener. Well, biblicist, yeah, I, what I mean by that simply is that um, how we understand ourselves and the nature of God is rooted in exegesis of texts, which are so, so, said to be inerrant, which means they're giving us propositionally true information. And, you know, there's a lot of that kind of biblicism out there, and so it, that's not a full-orbed way of looking at the nature of human drama vis-a-vis God. I think our actions and our practices, I mean, it's like every religion seems to know that. You know, Judaism, Buddhism, uh, you know, various forms of the Christian faith, but it seems that the evangelical world has some trouble with it, except for those who I know. I know, I know many evangelicals like this who are, who are understanding the need to connect more vibrantly with some type of liturgical practice, and where worship is more than an hour-long exegetical sermon. There's something else has to happen on that time. Yeah. And I, I think that's very, very important to remember. I'm reading, um, I have been reading Rowan Williams' book, uh, Being Christian, which is a very short little book. It's some lectures he gave that were transcribed, but he has four chapters, Baptism, Bible, Eucharist, and Prayer. That's it. Being Christian, Baptism, Bible, Eucharist, and Prayer. And yeah. there's a strong ethical dimension that runs through the book, but I look at that and I say, okay, I, w- I want to get my arms around that. That's very helpful, but that's not the way I was taught in the evangelical world as, as a teenager and in my early 20s. Being Christian means believing the right things and being pretty sure that you're believing the right things because the Bible says so here, 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 and here. You know, not taking advantage of, you know, what people call the body of Christ and and the centrality of worship, which is not mechanical, but it's something bigger than that. So in the opening of Inspiration and Incarnation, that's where you lay out this claim that there's 150 or so years of evidence that has been accumulated, unearthed, and now presented before us that we can't ignore if we want to understand the Bible from this point on. And in many ways, you you hint or suggest that this will almost revolutionize the way we read the Bible or apply it to our present context in certain ways. I was just wondering if you could summarize this evidence for us and then explain for us how it affects the way we read the Bible and therefore affects the way we embody our Christian life and practice. Yeah, I, I probably, if I were writing that today, I'd probably nuance it a little bit differently. Um <clears throat> Not like everything now changes forever, yeah. but it has added tremendous both complexities and benefits. You know, the, the the kind of archaeological evidence affects things like seeing that other ancient peoples had creation stories similar to ours, seeing how much things the Israelites took for granted and assumed far are far older than Israelite culture. Anything from like temples, prophets, priests, sacrifice. Um, poetry, wisdom, legal corpuses, things like that. There's hardly anything, in fact, there's probably nothing in the in the um, Hebrew Bible that doesn't have some sort of cultural antecedent, right? And that that does affect how you think of it. You don't think of it simply as a unique book that's dropped out of heaven. Here's, quote, the revelation and that nobody ever knew before, mm-hmm. right? But here is here is something that's deeply contextually bound. Now, I think, though, that, you know, it, it's not just, oh, well, I guess that's the Bible we have. You know, I, I'd like to also, um, you know, if we had more time, we'd explore in great depth, but how understanding something about how the Bible came to be, its cultural backgrounds, antecedents, um, when things were written, for example, right, Those kinds of things actually help us sort of come to terms with the theology of the text that we're reading, which is ultimately the point. It's to try to understand the theology. What are they writing about, and why would they say it the way they're saying it? Mm. Um, You know, I mean, a a, a good example comes, a couple from Deuteronomy, just very briefly, where Moses is speaking in the first five chapters, and he has this recurring refrain. He says, and you saw this, and you saw this, and you were there, and this is what happened to you. And then in chapter 5, it culminates with, it's with you here today that God made the covenant at Mount Sinai, not with, your ancestor, but not with your ancestors, but with all of you who are here today, right? Now, that's obviously wrong, 
right, from, let's say, a, you know, a, a, a straight propositional point of view, because the yeah. whole point of Deuteronomy is that this is 40 years later, they're all dead. That's, that's why they wandered in the desert. But that's a theologically powerful thing to say that alerts us to um, the, the function of Deuteronomy uh, theologically, right? So, um, for example, uh, you know, in, in chapter 4, uh, Moses talks about the entrance to Canaan, in the past in the past tense it's something that's already happened he says you know to this day and this is the, you know drove out the canaanites as it is to this day and you know that's very clearly suggesting like listen moses didn't write this but what you have in deuteronomy is like a mid first millennium reflection on israel's history that's now applied to a different point in time and you say different things and to me, that's a tremendously valuable theological lesson for us to learn, that we're meant, as people who are following God, we're meant to sort of make this stuff our own, and to work through our theology creatively, the way the Bible itself models for us. And that's something that is, is made clearer to us. I think the need to do that is made clearer to us by virtue of the fact that pretty much everybody thinks the book of Deuteronomy was written in the late 7th century and then edited for, you know, a, a generation or two or three after that going right. into the post-exilic period, right? That's an insight that says, oh my goodness gracious. See, to me, that sings theologically. Look at people, you know, living about a thousand years or so mm-hmm. after the time of Moses and Israel's origins. Look how they're handling this. That's of tremendous value to me. And that's the kind of stuff that we have access to nowadays that sort of orients the Bible a little bit differently for us. And I think it's very positive. What does that say for someone who doesn't have that information? Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when people have not even had Bibles, yeah, right, and God is still present with them, it's, you know, I think we'd agree it's better to have a Bible than nothing if you're a Christian, right? Right. Um, I also think it's better to have a Bible with an understanding of something from the background than not at all, right? Because you can understand maybe who Pharisees are historically, and, right. and, and, and that might shed light on why Jesus interacts with them. But it's not necessary, because, see, actually, we have to remember something here, too. The historical kinds of information we're talking about are very, very helpful to us when the topic of history comes up. I have no patience with people who want to make historical claims about the Bible without engaging historical evidence. I have very, I have no, no, I won't even say little, I have no patience with that. But for, let's say, the average everyday person throughout Christian history who hasn't had access to this stuff, you know, they're not necessarily, they're not asking historical kinds of questions. They're asking questions of personal faith and my engagement with God and how can I understand what God wants through reading this book. And there's nothing, I, I mean, I'm understating, there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm fine with that. I mean, in church or in my family or just friends, you know, they just, I, and, I, and I realize that I'm sort of in a privileged place because I get to do this all the time, right? And, and yeah. you know, I have fine-tuned kinds of disagreements with people that I have a lot of in common with. But, you know, th- there's something, though, uh, you know, basically comforting and nice to know that, you know, the, the Bible actually has a context, and and knowing that can help us actually go a little bit deeper. But I see, I wouldn't force that on people. They, they might yeah. want to have to come to that, or they might come to me with certain kinds of questions. I do get to force it on my college students, because that's what I get paid to do. You know, I, I expose them to things, but then we talk about it, right? So, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not like the only way to read the Bible, which is sort of, might, might have been sort of a, uh, a vibe that I got across in I&I, and I didn't really mean to. And if I did, I, yeah, I would probably nuance it a little bit differently today. What do we do with the fact that Jesus appears to treat the Old Testament the way that first century Jews treated the Old Testament, which appears to be they thought it happened? So does it matter if Jesus was, like, wrong about a historical thing, like, would God have corrected Jesus about that? Well, um, I mean, not to overstate, but what I've come to see is that at the end of the day, the real barrier in a lot of this comes down to Christology, okay. how you understand the nature of who Jesus is, right? 
And here's the thing. I mean, my friend and colleague Ken Sparks wrote about this in his book, Sacred Word, Broken Word. It came out maybe four or five years ago. It's, it's, it's a nice book. We, he digs into the, some of the stuff in a pretty, uh, you know, a, a approachable, readable way. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, if, 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 if Jesus is a human being, then Jesus is going to be limited the way human beings are limited, mm-hmm. right? So Jesus was Jewish. Jesus had a tradition. Jesus made assumptions about, you know, whether Adam was a real person or the first person, right? He made assumptions about, you know, whether there are continents. He made assumptions about languages that people speak, you know, outside of his region. You know, there, there are many things Jesus didn't know. He was limited in his knowledge, which, again, is part of the offense of the gospel, you have the God man who's thoroughly human looking at him and talking with him, right? So, you know, I, I, I would want to try to push people a little bit to at least grow comfortable with the fact that I would expect Jesus as a first century Jew to share the assumptions about, let's say, Israel's past that everyone else would also have assumed. But not to say that, okay, we have to stay there. But Jesus, I know Jesus said it, but do you hear what I just said? You know, if Jesus is fully human, right? um, And and the thing is that people say, well, that's ascribing error to Jesus. And I will jump up and down screaming saying, no, 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 no. It's not error. It's first centuryness. That's what it is. You know, I mean, the gospel writers talking about Jesus, remembering Jesus in different ways. Right and expressing Jesus, what he knew and didn't know, in different kinds of ways. Yeah. Right, Th- those things are all important too. So um, this is the mess you get into with this Christian religion, which has as its central point an incarnating God. But we cannot get away from that. We 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 want to rise above what God condescended to, which is the humanity. We want sort of the, the Platonic up there above the clouds view. We don't get that. What we do is we walk by faith, and that sounds like a like a, a slippery way of getting out of a difficult situation. No, it's excruciating. Hmm. We live we live by trusting God, even when these things don't make sense, and we're not the first people to think about them either. Right. And speaking to that, you've mentioned many times throughout this episode, very helpfully, that Christian faith isn't rooted in an intellectualization, but rather it's rooted, I believe you said, in the mercy of God. It's where you hope it's yeah, rooted. Yeah. Yeah. And we want to ask you, what would your personal bedrock be? That core root of your Christian faith, should everything else be questioned or challenged? <laughs> I feel like everything has been questioned or challenged, and <laughs> depending, on what day, depending on what day of the week we're in, though. But I think it's... I, I have to think about how to answer that mm-hmm. question. That's a very, very good question. I would... I would say something along the lines of, and then I want to flesh it out and qualify it and all that sort of stuff, something about the reality of the presence of God in my conscious mind and how that really affects who I am and what I do. Um, and the notion that, you know, there's much to what we don't know about God apophatic theology, Um, you know, in addition to sort of what we do know. What we do know, we always know imperfectly, and that's just the way it is. And for whatever reason, psychologically, for me now at my age, I'll be 56 in a few days, um, that is a very relaxing and comforting thought that I, I can try to rest in God more than have just better arguments. Thank you so much for spending a bit of the morning with us. It's been very insightful. And where can people find you online? You also, you have a podcast coming out. What's it called? When, you know, whatever. Yeah, it's called um, the Bible for Normal People podcast, which is also the name of my website, the Bible for Normal People. You can also reach it at PeteEnds.com. And, you know, I blog there about three times a week. Um and I other kinds of reflections, and I have my books listed there, and sort of where I'll be speaking and things like that. Pretty pretty standard website, but that's the best place to reach me. All right. Well, thanks so much, man. And maybe uh, maybe we'll have you on again to to delve deeper into some of these questions. Yeah, sure. It's been great. All right, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for listening. Next week, join us for John and I answering the question. What must one believe to be saved? 
If you're enjoying the show, it would really help us, especially as a brand new podcast, for you to leave a rating and or a review. So if you like what you're hearing, please do that. We've got some essays up at reconstructpodcast.com if you want to go check those out. And you can find us on Twitter and Facebook if you want to connect there. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.